Hello, and thank you for clicking on this video from Checkmate Humanity. In previous videos on this channel, I reported on a number of channel-on-channel -channel lawsuits associated with Watts Island. The vast majority of these lawsuits were filed really by one channel, Truth and Transparency, a channel hosted by Lana Oriani. Today, I have an update. On December 18th, just a few days ago, a judge in Ohio summarily dismissed a $1 million defamation, and yes, I mean defamation, lawsuit that was brought against me by Lana Oriani of that YouTube channel, Truth and Transparency, and who runs a nonprofit called Fight for a Family. It's a public charity. Oriani filed the lawsuit on November 11th, 2021 to much buildup and fanfare on YouTube, and last Wednesday, the court tossed it due to want of prosecution. In layman's terms, want of prosecution means that she lost the case because she couldn't meet simple deadlines. In a minute, I'm going to do a brief walkthrough of her case against me and what the judge means by want of prosecution. But if I was the only person on YouTube that was sued by truth and transparency, I wouldn't be doing this video. I'm making this video to talk about vexatious litigation, what it looks like, and YouTube's heavy contribution to it. Now, what is vexatious litigation? First, I'm going to give you the legal definition, then I'm going to show you what it actually looks like to use YouTube towards those ends. Now, vexatious litigation, according to Cornell Law School, is legal proceedings started with malice and without good. Now, it says on their website, site case, but it should say cause. And just to, to put a little pause in that right there, this is legitimately Cornell's law school website where they define legal terms. It's a good source, but they also have a typo on their website. Mistakes are made by legal institutions, by law schools, by all kinds of people. Mistakes on websites and in publicly published documents are not conspiracies. Okay, moving on. Vexatious litigation is meant to bother, embarrass, or cause legal expenses to the defendant. A plaintiff who starts such litigation either knows or should reasonably know that no legal basis for the lawsuit exists. To obtain a remedy for vexatious lit litigation, the injured party often files a claim for malicious prosecution. Now, what is a vexatious litigant? And this is from California's civil procedure section. I believe that these laws vary from state to state to state. Uh, I chose California because that's where I am. But just to note, some of these definitions and laws can vary from state to state. In the immediately preceding seven year period has commenced, prosecuted, or maintained in propria persona at least five litigations other than small claims court that have been one, finally determined adversely to the person or two, unjustifiably permitted to remain pending at least two years without having been brought to trial or hearing. After a litigation has been finally determined against the person, repeatedly retaliates or attempts to retaliate in propria persona either one, the validity of the determination against the same defendant or defendants as to whom the litigant was finally determined, or two, the cause of action, claim, controversy, or any of the issues of fact or law determined or concluded by the final determination against the same defendant or defendants as to whom the litigation was finally determined. So basically saying they keep fighting after a court has made a determination, they continue retaliating upon the person that they already filed against. In any litigation, while in propria persona, repeatedly files unmeritorious motions, pleadings, or other papers, conducts unnecessary discovery, or engages in other tactics that are frivolous or solely intended to cause unnecessary delay, has previously been declared a vexatious litigant by any state or federal court of record in any action or proceeding based on the same or substantially similar facts, transaction, or occurrence. So those are the defen definitions of vexatious litigation and vexatious litigant.
Now, after hearing those definitions, consider this. Lana Oriani's case against me is one of nine, yes, nine legal actions that she has filed against other YouTubers in the last two years. That's just YouTubers. There are more against other people that have happened in years past as well within that five year time span that is under the, these defi legal definitions. But as you just heard, a volume of cases is not the only criteria for being a vexatious litigant. It also involves how the litigant conducts themselves in relation to that litigation. So let's take a look at Oriani's conduct with regard to her case against me and how vastly the behavior looks on and off of YouTube. Now, before Oriani filed any paperwork with the court, she went live for her lawsuit against me. She went live in November of 2021 to say that she was planning to file 12 lawsuits by Christmas. She even had a brand and a sizzle video for it, and she called it Lannis Slanderous Slays. A few days later, on November 11, 2021, Oriani went live to announce that she had filed a lawsuit against me and read the entire complaint on her live stream. So slanderous slay number one was me, and I learned about it on YouTube, where she read her entire complaint against me. A few days later, after that, she went live to announce slanderous slay number two, and that was J is for Justice. She then proceeded to read that complaint on her live stream. A few days later, she went live to announce that she was about to file a lawsuit against another YouTuber called Natasha Cooper, and she read part of that complaint and said she was filing it the next day, but that lawsuit was never filed. In fact, there, was n there were no more slanderous slays. She had promoted 12 slanderous slays in her big promotion, but in the end, there were only two slays before Christmas. Now, obviously, I became aware of her lawsuit against me when she talked about it on her YouTube channel multiple times, and that's exactly what she intended to happen, is for me to know that. And because it was against me, I accessed the public docket in her county to confirm that it was filed and was able to print out the complaint for myself. And then I did a live stream on a side channel of mine, type and and the video is titled laugh with me about Lana's vexatious litigation in this live stream. I read through her complaint and made commentary and I'll provide a link to that live stream in the description below. Now, if we're going to be true to the timeline here, it's only fair for me to also add here that I also filed a lawsuit against Oriani and several other YouTube people just a few weeks later in January of 2022. I started preparing this lawsuit months beforehand, but got very serious about it in December of 2021 when the harassment steeply escalated. I didn't file my lawsuit pro se. I paid good money for a qualified attorney to write the legal paperwork and make the proper legal filings and the proper service to the other parties. And there's another thing I did differently with my lawsuit. I didn't make YouTube content out of it. I didn't capitalize on it. I did no fundraisers. I asked for no help. I didn't talk about it at all on YouTube. And that's because I didn't file a lawsuit so I could make content out of it. I filed it because I truly felt that I had legitimate legal complaints. And most of the behavior was being carried out on YouTube because of YouTube. Now I've since dismissed that lawsuit against all those defendants I named because even though I didn't say anything about it on YouTube, the behavior toward me on YouTube changed drastically. And that's really all I wanted in the first place. I just wanted it to stop and it did. And just be clear, I'm not saying I know for sure that the offensive behavior stopped because I filed the lawsuit. I'm saying that there was a noticeable change in behavior toward me after I dropped the lawsuit and I didn't feel like dropping any more of my hard earned dollars on legal expenses just to prove I was right, especially when I knew I was right. All I cared about was that it stopped. I gave you that background to be transparent with you and to give you some context and to offer it as a contrast to Lana Oriani's conduct on and off YouTube when it came to her own litigation. That sets the context for the documents I'm about to read to you from Oriani's lawsuit against me. And as I read through these particular documents, I'll give me my commentary about them for the first time since they were posted on the docket. I gave commentary about the initial filing, but these are subsequent. This is a subsequent filing. This is a motion to request non-dismissal. I want to say something about all the redactions here. 
Lana has chosen to post her full name online. I've never myself chosen to pull to post my full legal name online. So that's why I have redacted where all the different places where she has posted my full, my, my, my name in this document. Now I'm not saying she did anything wrong by putting my name in this document because it's a legal document. That's fine. I don't care about that. I'm just saying that's why I've redacted my last name out of this document while I'm put it on, putting it in this YouTube video. As a reminder, Lana Oriani filed her lawsuit against me in November of 2021. It was then upon her to serve me, which means a, a lawsuit is not valid until legally recognized service is completed to the other party. And that is not, that is not by sending them an email it's not by sending them a certified mail to their address and just, and just hoping that it gets there. It's by making sure that a service processor serves them, or it's asking the court, may I send certified mail? And if they say, yes, you can send certified mail, then you still need to show a, a signature from that person saying I have received this. That was never achieved in this case because Ms. Oriani never had my correct address and one of the reasons she never had my correct address is because I never wanted this person to have my correct address. I made sure that this person never had my correct address because I believe she would do harmful things with my address. And I stand by that. So she did not serve me, although she wasn't able to achieve service there were automatic hearing dates set up in the docket. And as the filing party, as the party who was requesting relief from the court, it was her responsibility to, to attend those dates and make her case. She did not attend those dates. So the, so the judge, the court, posted on the docket an order to show cause telling Ms. Oriani that if she wants this case to go forward, she's going to have to show evidence that she tried to, uh, to that she tried to do service and, uh, and proof of her claims. Now, if you want to go see the uh, original complaint against me, a link in the description below of me responding to her lawsuit, it's where she, where she accuses me of defamation and she makes all kinds of claims about all, all these things that I did to launch and launch a defamation, launch a defamatory agenda toward her that I conspired with all kinds of people to do, to, um, create a sex scandal about her. In this complaint document, she makes all these claims without showing any proof. And basically the judge was saying, uh, you need to show uh, some sort of proof that this case should move forward. And by the way, this judge was, was filing this order weeks after she was supposed to show up for a hearing and did not show up for a hearing. So after the judge posted the order to show cause a couple weeks after, Ms. Oriani filed this paperwork called motion to request non-dismissal. And just as an FYI, as far as I can tell, I've done some research. Uh, there's no such kind of motion in usual legal practice, in procedural legal practice. But let me read this to you. Ms. Oriani is requesting for this honorable court to not dismiss this civil action under the following for the following reasons. One, Ms. Oriani attempted to serve respondent via certified mail to an old address on or about November 12th, 2021. On or about November 17th, 2021, Ms. X read her complaint online to an audience and posted it online through her YouTube account, even though she had refused service. Okay. There are two problems with those two statements that she just made. One is I did not refuse service because she did not send it to a correct address. And number two is she failed to 
mention that on November 11th, she read the entire complaint on her YouTube channel after heavily promoting that she was going to sue 12 people, including me. So she obviously intended for me to know that she was going to sue me. In fact, she had been threatening to sue me and many other people. So it was impossible for me not to know in practice that she was suing me, but that, that the court does not recognize YouTube as a method of service. Okay. Continuing on. Ms. Oriani then attempted to serve Ms. X via certified mail to a Cal to another address, another old address that I haven't lived in for most of my life. Okay. On or about January 12th, 2022, she then retaliated with filing her own California lawsuit against Ms. Oriani in January of 2022, where Ms. Oriani had accepted the documents. So she's basically saying, Hey, I accepted service for the lawsuit she filed against me. And she's claiming in this document that I filed in retaliation to her, even though we don't even, we don't need to get into argument about that. It was definitely not a retaliatory lawsuit. As Ms. X had retained legal counsel, Ms. Oriani had been in contact with her attorney. However, Ms. X had instructed her attorney to refuse service. Since the public reading online, she has made yet another most recent, uh, has made yet another most recent acknowledgement of her lawsuit on December 6, 2022. Even with these online acknowledgements, Ms. X has refused every avenue that Ms. Oriani has attempted to serve her. The attorney I hired in California was not hired to handle the case of Oriani versus me. He was hired to handle the case of me versus Oriani et al. For this lawyer to accept service on my behalf in Ohio, A, he would have to be barred, licensed in the state of Ohio, and he would have to put in a, a notice of representation that he is representing me. None of those things had been done. So the vast majority of this paragraph one plainly misrepresents the situation. Okay, this is paragraph two of her filing. Ms. X has been part of a group of online YouTubers that have participated in Operation Take Down Lana since January 2021. Ms. X has used her YouTube channel to continue her defamation, spelled correctly there, and reputation smear campaign. She has campaigned with numerous other YouTube channel holders, and then she lists a bunch of people. I'm redacting their names because... None of them deserve to be put more on blast than they already have. The, the people have been filed against in Franklin. Now, here's where she gets into acknowledging that she has filed all kinds of legal cases against all these other people for alleged defamation and alleged Operation Take Down Lana. Okay. The following people have been filed against in Franklin Court of Common Pleas. And then she and then she lists the people. So she's acknowledging and she lists four different people that she's filed against in Ohio. And I think she believes that uh, if she lists all the people that she's filed against, she's proving that she has uh, she has legitimate legal claims against people. But actually what she's proving to the court by listing all these is that she has a tendency to use the court to, to create false allegations against them. That's my opinion. Now the third paragraph states the following as recent in the past week, Ms. X has put out multiple online videos and community posts on her YouTube channel that defame, intimidate, harass, annoy, and mentally anguish Ms. Oriani to the point that Ms. Oriani has, is now within legal standing to file for a protection order based in Ohio state statutes. 
that include telecommunications harassment and menacing by stalking. So she's basically saying that as a public figure, she is, she is a public figure, Ms. Oriani is a public figure, and that if a public figure has somebody say words about them on the internet, that is menacing by stalking. Ms. Oriani will be filing for a protective order against me. With that being stated, Ms. Oriani is concerned with being able to properly serve Ms. Fox. That's right, because you will never find me. I've moved to a place where I will never reveal the address of where I live to anybody because of people like you. On a community post on my page, she has compared Ms. Oriani to an accused pedo. Jared Lysick, a founding member of Adventures with Purpose. And in one of the comments below one of her videos, Ms. Fox has written, now understand this, the following paragraph I'm about to read is her citation for why she believes I am harassing and menacing stalking her and has the right to file a civil protection order. Okay, this is what I wrote. Did you get a load of that prayer? Laugh emoji. I've heard her say she's Catholic, but her prayer was an eclectic, eclectic mix of Catholic, evangelical Christian, and Latter-day Saints. She gets around. Don't get too worried about her numbers. They are ill-gotten gains, and the bigger she gets, the more important it will be for YouTube that she not use her channel as a weapon. She can't help herself, so it will just put her higher on the radar. We shouldn't have to endure her BS until that happens, but that unfortunately is the way it is. That's the, that's the totality of my comment, okay? That was on my channel. I did not go to her channel to say that. That is on my channel. So she continues, please see the other information section below for links to my YouTube channel and most recent videos. And the most recent videos she links to are videos where I show that she is lying about people in murder cases. Ms. Oriani's above statements show just cause as to why the courts should not dismiss Ms. Oriani's lawsuit. Especially with the latest personal info that X uploaded where she tells the world that Ms. Oriani has sued her and then in the same breath defames Ms. Oriani and the organization she stated she, she started a 501c3 nonprofit fight for her family. Just to set things straight, I am not the one who first told the world that Ms. Oriani filed a lawsuit against me. That was first made public to the world on November 11th, 2021, after it was heavily promoted on her YouTube channel. Okay. Five, additional information. Now she goes on to list all the cases that she has filed against other parties. She then provides URLs to my channel where I posted videos where I was providing a cautionary tale about how she has a tendency uh, to create innocent victims in true crime cases. And I showed examples of those. And she provides links to those videos. In these videos, I'm not making baseless accusations. I'm actually showing proof of these claims. And then in future, in, in a most recent video, I showed definitive proof of these claims. So when something is true and it's proven, or at least there's a very good reason for me to believe that it's true and I'm not maliciously making these things up, that is not defamation. And as she is a public figure and I have a First Amendment right, it is my right to make those videos. So that was her filing. That is, the, that is where she, two, two weeks after the judge asked her to show cause, she says, now I want to file a protection order against her and here are all the other lawsuits I filed. To me, that particular filing shows that she has a lack of awareness of how her actions are going to actually come across in court. Here is the, the, the entry of dismissal. There are three different documents that the court filed in response to her 
motion to request non-dismissal. This is just one of them because they all basically say the same thing, but you catch the, the gist. It says, entry of dismissal. On December 2nd, 2022, the court ordered plaintiff to show cause why this case should not be dismissed under blah, blah, blah for her failure to prosecute. Plaintiff had failed to appear for both the November 7th final pretrial conference and the November 21st, 2022 trial. Plaintiff never contacted the court regarding her failures to show. On December 13th, 2022, plaintiff filed a response to the court's show cause order. Plaintiff merely recites the purported merits of her case, but does not demonstrate why she failed to attend the critical hearing dates as provided in the case schedule. Therefore, the court hereby orders this case be dismissed, and it is so ordered, and therefore the case is dismissed. I want to remind you that this person makes a living growing her channel by tearing apart word for word every single court document that comes out of a true crime case. Okay? She picks it apart. She scrutinizes it. She acts as if it is the actual official trial document that is going to be used in prosecution. She finds holes, she makes shaky connections, and she represents herself as an authority in the ability to understand how procedure works in a court of law. And yet, she lost this lawsuit essentially on procedure, essentially on the inability to show up and meet deadlines. And I've seen people in her chat say, you're so amazing, Lana, you should, you should become a lawyer. Folks, the stuff I just showed you is basic procedural stuff that any lawyer knows like the back of their hand. It's their muscle memory. If you can't get past that stuff, there's no way you can get a four-year education, pass your, pass your LSAT or get a good enough LSAT score to get into law school, and then get through all the three rigorous years of law school. And then pass the bar where you want to practice to become a lawyer. None of those things have been done by this person who claims to have more knowledge than the lawyers in these cases, than the law enforcement in these cases. She shames the DA. She shames the judges. She shames practically anyone in authority that happens to touch these cases, including the documents that come out. Okay. But in her own case, while she's making a big fanfare on YouTube about what, about how amazing she is, even in the case against me and her other opponents, she can't even meet court deadlines. She can't even make a simple case for herself. So with that, now I'm going to show you a, a, a brief reel just to show you how much she weaponized the combination of the court system and YouTube really to try to silence me. You insane because i fill out an affidavit so this is on may 29th 2021 a few days after an alleged sex panel scandal where she was accused of sexual misconduct and she's uh, aiming this message at me and other people that she believes orchestrated the whole thing okay i'm covering my ass and i'm going after your guys's asses now this will be handled through law enforcement agencies, period. Because like I said, you're messing with the wrong person. On June 21st, 2021, uh, I had posted a video showing some pretty disgusting behavior and I entitled it, don't say we didn't warn you about the predators on planet Watts. And she writes, see you in court, baby doll. And on November 3rd, 2021, she writes my channel name and then says other people and then says that we made up her sex panel scandal towards me and says, get that defense fund going, honey. You're going to need way more than 7K for this lawsuit. I think that was 
that was uh, aimed toward Natasha Cooper, but she's basically uh, implying that we are all involved and she's coming for all of us. Here she is posting a, a video from my, sing, from my singing channel and tags me and other people and says, read Lynn's own words about me and please go and see Lynn's video from March 15th about my nonprofit. I'll see you in the courtroom, Lynn and Coop. So one, um, you know, more, uh, more threats about the courtroom. Here is her promotional video. <laughs> See how it says Lana Slanderous Slays is coming to town? A few days later, she talked about the 12 days of Santa's Slanderous Slays in a two hour and 24 minute and 11 second video. She promoted her Slanderous Slays and then she read the entire complaint against me in this video on November 11th. And then in December, she continues to promote Lana Slander Slays with where, where she reads part of her complaint about Natasha Cooper, but then eventually does not file that lawsuit. And here on her community wall, she uh, writes the names of all kinds of people that have defamed her. So now she's more talking about all these people who she believes have famed her. All these people here, Kelly, Jamie, Ronnie, and Cindy, those are Watts family and friends. She wrote my full name on her channel and then my former channel name. Unfortunately, before I could even get one foot out the door with Fight for a Family. This is about 20 minutes into the video where she reads her complaint about me. And as you can see, she has fightforafamily.com up on the screen. And she starts in introducing the idea about her defamation claim against me um, after talking about her dream of starting a nonprofit and uh, all the wonderful things that she does for family members and taking the tone of that she's been uh, victimized by all these people and and that I'm and that I'm one of them. One night worth of dreaming uh, of these amazing possibilities, the unthinkable and unimaginable happened. <clears throat> my journey begins now uh, to fight for my dreams, my livelihood the truth and proper justice. Remember how this ended up. So this, she's reading this on November 11th, 2021. She's, she's making a very important, impactful, poignant statement about what she's about to do to file this lawsuit. And then she fails to prosecute it. She can't meet simple deadlines. She doesn't contact the court. She doesn't even tell the court that her address has changed until this recent December. Her address had changed well before that, but she didn't tell them until this last December. You can follow these 12 episodes, which begins today, to see how I ended up where I am today. <clears throat> Again, today is one of 12 days that I will take the time to address publicly each civil complaint by reading a redacted copy of the complaint uh, and what has happened to, to me over the past nine months is my true crime story. So this is something that she does regularly is when, even when she is legitimately challenged, rather than legitimately defending herself with facts and evidence that she does in fact have a legitimate nonprofit she makes it into a true crime case against her. In the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas, Columbus, Ohio, Lana Oriani plaintiff verse to be held redacting here, Miss Lynn. Given a TPO and this judge grant. Now this is from March of 2022, okay? This is after she went to Colorado to fight against getting a permanent protection order against her and lost. And she went on her channel and said this. A PPO out on me. All of you guys will start getting the same fucking thing and it's gonna start with, with me. That's retaliatory litigation. 
In other words, that's vexatious litigation. You see, just like her coverage of the four college students who were slain in Ohio, everything is content to her. And she will milk that content for whatever it's worth. No matter how she destroys people along the way, no matter how she misrepresents what's really happening in court, and all this while presenting herself as a savior to the wrongfully accused. Now, let's, let's look at her real track record, shall we? Here is her scoreboard with regard to her nonprofit cases, the cases she covers on her true crime channel, and her own personal court cases, okay? In her own YouTube court cases, LO versus LF, that's me, she has lost. LO versus VWM FS, that's a civil matter, that's TBD, but it has the same exact accusations against them as she does me. LO versus J for J, a civil matter, that's pending, but I believe that's going to have the same outcome as mine because the same, the docket looks exactly the same. VW versus LO PPO, that is where Another YouTuber filed for a PPO against her in Colorado. Ms. Oriani went and fought it vigorously in, court, in Colorado in a, in a very lengthy hearing and lost that one. LO versus VW CPO. This is where Lana has now turned around and filed uh, for a civil protection order against the same person who has a stalking order against her in Colorado. She filed against that same person in Ohio, and that is pending decision right now. LO versus VB, CPO, same thing. That is pending. She has filed a protection order against another YouTuber. That was fought in court, and it is pending decision. LO versus KK, CPO. Honestly, I have no idea where that stands. I don't even know if this KK was served. LO versus FS, CPO. My understanding is, I don't know for sure, my understanding is that this person hasn't been served. So that's still TBD. But that's, not, that's still not a very good track record in terms of her own cases when she speaks so confidently and authoritatively about how, about how knowledgeable she is with regard to court procedure and, and the law. Now, for her own fight for her family cases where she has represented families, in the Watts case, He's in prison for life. In the Jeter case, he's in prison for life. Brown, still in prison for life. Parton, still considered guilty. Okay? In the true crime cases that she has covered on YouTube, same thing. Watts had all these conspiracy theories that I pointed out in my last video. Not true. Same with Del Tondo. Uh, she keeps putting out all these conspiracy theories about what happened there that don't involve Sheldon Jeter Jr., who some believe did it, uh, hasn't been able to prove that. Nobody has been charged with her murder. With Pew, Sheldon Jeter Jr. has been convicted of that. He is serving life in prison right now. Uh, there is a decision pending wh whether he'll get a new trial, but so far he's still a convicted murderer. With Delphi, she had been covering Delphi pretty heavily right before they actually, they actually charged and booked a, a suspect. And she was nowhere near that person. She was very fixated on this uh, Keegan guy. Idaho 4, uh, before they picked up Brian Koberger, she was way off into the weeds uh, accusing all kinds of college students. And in all honesty, she's still in my opinion, accusing these college students and trying to take the heat off of Brian Koberger for whatever reason, but it is a known pattern with her. So that's her scoreboard. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what a vexatious litigant looks like on YouTube. And after all the facts I've put before you, I truly don't understand how any self-respecting person trusts one word that comes out of her mouth especially when it comes to all of her hubris about her inside knowledge of the judicial system. The other thing we all have to wonder is how any of this would be possible without YouTube. 
I've just demonstrated countless times when YouTube was used to promote and boast about a lawsuit. By the time something becomes a lawsuit, it's up to the courts to decide the outcome. You can claim victory as many times as you want on YouTube, but that doesn't make it right or true. And it won't help you win, especially if you can't follow directions that most fifth graders could follow. Now look at all of the ways Oriani used YouTube to make content out of her lawsuit against me. Then remember that she has done that nine times over as indicated on the scoreboard. I'll let other people tell their own stories about it, but and when we talk about vexatious litigants and how they behave, behave after a court has, has made their decision, after the court in Colorado made their decision that she had a permanent protection order against her, Oriani continued, continued her behavior on YouTube and continued to create extremely disturbing content about that other YouTuber. She re and she has, in my view, retaliated against that other YouTuber by filing a civil protection order on her, which was just heard in court and pending decision. So we'll see what happens to that. But in my view, that fits the, the definition of a vexatious litigant. When you're filing all kinds of lawsuits, you're posting content on YouTube, and you're retaliating when the decision doesn't go your way in court. None of this would have been possible without YouTube's rage hungry algorithm and its inability to enforce its own terms of service. In my opinion, if YouTube wasn't such a powerful and profitable weapon, half of this wouldn't be happening. Some of it would because sadists be sadists, no matter where they go, no matter what tool they use. But without YouTube's help, they wouldn't be half as effective. They wouldn't have a fraction of the audience and they couldn't make a dime off of it. For now, it's too damn easy to profit off of the pain of true crime victims. So it will keep spiraling out of control until someone puts up a goalpost. It's either going to have to be YouTube, it's going to have to be the courts, or it's going to have to be both. But until that happens, we're all exposed to the possibility of some vexatious litigant coming along and doing everything in their power to disrupt your life. I made this video to show you what that looks like and whether you take it to heart is up to you. But if you get caught up in some drama on YouTube and don't watch for signs of vexatious litigation after watching this video, all I can do is wish you Godspeed. Peace out. Please be kind and remember to like and subscribe and consider becoming a member. Thank you very much.